Good evening to everyone. Good to be with you this evening as we have come together to study from God's Word. And I hope again that you'll be encouraged by the things that I'll be pre presenting uh, this uh, evening. I want to express my appreciation to Brother Doug for providing uh, breakfast this morning. I enjoyed being with the men as we gathered together and had uh, just a great time and discussion and encouraging one another. And then I want to express my appreciation to the Holloway family for providing uh, dinner this evening. I really enjoyed being with you, just having a great time. Again, just renewing the old acquaintances and just enjoying our friendship uh, that we've had uh, over the years. And certainly I have been truly blessed by the kind things that you have said, your prayers that you have offered. I have had a great time also uh, with uh, the radio program, enjoyed that, spending time with Brother Holloway and, and as we uh, open up the word and just uh, reminding everyone about what was going on uh, this week in regards to uh, our study or series of lessons. And so tonight I would encourage you uh, to continue to open your Bibles and study along. And if you have any questions in regards to the lesson, we invite you to write that down and get with me afterwards. I'll be glad to uh, discuss these things with you because it's all about learning. It's all about growing. And I am open to suggestions and encouragement uh, to study and to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of God's will. And so tonight, uh, if I stir your mind and your heart uh, to consider doing what the Lord has required of all of us in obedience to the gospel. I want to encourage you. That's my point. I want to do that because it's all about serving him because our souls hang in the balance and God has provided a way that we can es uh, escape his eternal wrath. And so you would, uh, you would give us joy if you responded to the call of God in Christ Jesus. And so tonight, as we look back at some of the things that we have talked about and discussed, remember our thoughts were uh, beginning from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 25. And we were talking about the first part of that, uh, those verses uh, there, by what authority are you doing these things? And this is what the chief priests and the elders were asking Jesus after he had cleansed the temple. And then what we saw there with them doing that, that there is this concept of authority and what all of that means and the need for it. And as we have seen that it's about really the power to do something. And we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. The right to give commands, the right to issue laws, and uh, the last point, the permission to act. And I want us to be able to see this in order as I will talk about them uh, this evening. And then we also saw that need for authority as expressed there in Acts chapter 19. When you had a mob that was, was, there was chaos, there was confusion, there was abuse, there was injustice. And what authority does, it brings order. And as even was mentioned there, that they had to assemble themselves in a lawful assembly. Because in the lawful assembly, there would be our order. There is a procedure that they would have to go through. And so that's when it come, uh, what happens when you and I abide by the standard that God has given. And what was that standard that tells us about God's instruction? And that was, as we talked about, the word of God, that it dictates, guides governs, rules, and directs. That's what God's word does. And this was given to us by him. And so uh, we, uh, we benefit from it and we do well to adhere to those things that are uh, presented to us. And then looking at that, we saw that God directs man by direct statements, approved examples, and then we have the information to draw the necessary conclusion. So tonight, I want to pick up with the latter part of Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 and 25. And that is Jesus' answer or response to those who had challenged him by what authority. And so Jesus replies to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Now notice what he does. He says, the baptism of John was from what source? 
from heaven or from men. You know what he caused them to do? They got up in a huddle. <laughs> he caused them to think about what they were asking. And they said, you know, if we say from men, he, uh, we're gonna, he's going to ask us, uh, then why do we do what we do? And if we say from heaven, why don't we obey what God says? And so they said, well, neither. <laughs> that was their answer, neither. See, Jesus knew their heart. They knew the right answer. As we had one question came in, what do you do when someone uh, rejects uh, the truth and say, that's your interpretation? You see, the Pharisees or the chief priests and the elders here, they were being, they were intellectually dishonest. They knew the right answer. And they didn't answer it properly. Thought that they could skirt the issue. So they were being dishonest here. And so from these passages, we realize, we realize that there is this need of authority. And then by Jesus' response, we realize that there are two sources of authority. And as Jesus points out, there is the source of heaven and there is the source of men. And so tonight we're going to talk about those things, why it is so and I want us to really examine the evidence and draw the conclusion which is the best source to follow. What is the best source to follow when it comes to authority and especially in our relationship with God? So let's begin by looking at that first aspect of Defining what authority is, and that is having the proper perspective. Now, we're going to talk about the first source, and the first source is God. When Jesus is referring to heaven, he's referring to God, his Father. Now, remember the statement that I made in regards to authority and what it means? The right to give commands. Why does God have the right to give commands? Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, notice what the writer points out for us when we read that passage. And many of us are familiar with this. That passage carries a lot of weight. And the weight that the passage carries, as it states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why God has the right to command or give these instructions because he is the creator. And you see here from the passage, naturally, if God is the creator, naturally, he is the owner. He is in charge. That's what Genesis 1 and verse 1 is pointing out. And I'll tell you what, I'm only on the second level of understanding or pointing out here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. There are other things that we could talk about in reference to Genesis chapter 1. We can go to the third, fourth, fifth sixth level of study and understanding this one verse. But that would take up the rest of our time. There's more things I want to get through tonight. So when it comes to God, He is the source of the world. He is the source of who you and I are. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, a passage that we are familiar with, and we often quote, and as the John points out, and, and, and to produce faith in individuals, that's the purpose of the writing of the Gospel of John. But notice verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3. All things came into being 
through him. When God spoke, things came into existence. When God spoke, it happened. And then John is telling us about this. And he says, and apart from him, nothing came into being. And that has come into being. So John is letting us know that God is the source of all things. And what is interesting is verse 14, that the word became flesh. God was walking among his creation in Jesus Christ. That's awesome, isn't it? The word that brought us into existence is now the one that is walking among his creation. And his most prized creation was man. Because God created us all. Here's another passage. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, as Paul writes to the Colossian brethren, one of the things that I appreciate about the writings of Colossians uh, to these brethren here is you had the area of Areopolis and Laodicea. These were very uh, affluent areas. Colossae was not as affluent as those two areas. And the brethren probably thought, well, if we're not affluent as those areas are, then really does God really care for us? And really the letter is to show the Colossian brethren that you could serve God no matter what condition you are in. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, you still can serve the Christ. He is for you. He does care. He does love you. He will provide. You must follow. So yes, God cares about you. He doesn't care about what you don't have. He doesn't care about what you do have. What he cares about is you and that you could serve him. And he made it possible through Christ Jesus. So in verse 15, beginning, notice what he says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In other words, he's the source. He's the source of creation, as we read over there in John chapter 1. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. The things that you and I can see and the things that you and I can't see. In other words, there is a spiritual world. That's what he's talking about. Christ created that. The world. The word did this. Whether thrones or dominions or whether rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's at the center of it all. So do you see why he has the right to give commands? He's the source. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Because of who he is, because of the word of his, the power of his word, things stay where they ought to be. Our universe has order to it. If it didn't have order, you would have the planets colliding with each other. You wouldn't have the seasons that we have. Some areas are better than others in there. <laughs> I know right now they're experiencing some snow there in, in uh, Cincinnati. They show pictures of it on the ground. And my wife, she said, you took all the warm weather with you. <laughs> but the Christ, the word created all of these things. They hold together. It's for him. It's all about him. And as you continue to read these things, Paul says in verse 18, he 
is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In other words, the first one to rise from the dead and die no more. That's God. That's the Christ. That's the word. That's the one who gave his life for us, who was a sacrifice uh, for our benefit. Because it says later on in verse 18, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. When I, when I read that, it also reminds me of what God had said to Israel. Remember after, after he delivered them from Egyptian bondage. Matter of fact, I, I'll tell you what, let me hold on that because I'm going to talk about that just in just a few moments. I'm just anxious to get there <laughs> because all the beautiful and wonderful things that are there. Here's another thing in connection to this. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 with me. And what we will see is why God has the authority or the right to issue command. In John, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, we are being told about the virgin birth. And then it says in verse 6, and this was in response to encourage Ahab to take faith or have faith in God. He says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. What we're seeing from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, the reason why God has the right to issue command is because on him he is, or he is that counselor. The government is on his shoulder, in other words, rulership. And when we're talking about a counselor, one who gives instruction, one who gives advice. Everything and anything he does will be the best. Remember the creation again back there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31? After God had completed everything, he looked at it and he's, it was very good. <laughs> it was perfect in every aspect. Even as I had pointed out when I started the series of lessons, the religion of Christ, it is the best of all possible religions, the religion of Christ. Because he is the ultimate when it comes to counsel. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, as Paul was writing to those brethren at Ephesus, he makes this particular point here in reference to there in chapter 3. Remember, he says, when you read, you're, you will understand my mystery in Christ Jesus or into the, the mystery of Christ there. And then notice when you drop down to verse 8, he says, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, notice, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to light what is the administration of that mystery. When he's talking about uh, ministration here, he's talking about the rulership, the whole the whole system that God put in place to save man. And then he goes on to say, which for ages had been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenly places. It's all about God again here. And Paul is saying the administration of God is beyond him. 
It's beyond all of us put together. That's how wise, that's how powerful our God is. And that's what he's pointing out here. Then the question is, why would we put our faith in anything else? And it's sad that many have turned away from God. Turned away from his wisdom. Turned away from his counsel. Because true counsel of life is found in him. That was the whole point that John brings to our attention there in John 1 verse 4. In him was life. And what was that life? It was the light of men. Showing man how they ought to live. How we ought to live before God. That's what Jesus was doing. He was setting that example for us to follow in his footstep, as Peter recorded there over in 1 Peter. It's all about him. It's all about God. And then here's something else in connection to that. In the counsel about life and how to live, then you have a passage like Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12, uh, verses 10 through 13, excuse me, he is considered the great physician there. The one who is able to heal. In other words, when Jesus was healing all those who were sick, here's the picture that's being given here. Modern medicine could not touch the deepest need that man has. There's not enough money in this world to wash away the deepest need that we have. Many people are searching. They're looking into drugs to try to find or fill that void. They have walked away from the counsel of God. They are living their lives thinking that it will fill their need. And let me share this with you. Those of us who are married, if you are marrying someone to fill the deepest need that you have, you're going to fail. If I'm looking to my wife to fill my deepest need, she can't do it. And if she's looking to me to fill her deepest need, I can't do it. But God can, you see. That's why he's called the great physician. He's able to heal He's able to fill that void in our lives. And that void is him. He needs to fill it. And when he fills it, when someone is no longer following the Lord, I will remain faithful to him. If my wife falters, I'm going to remain faithful to the Christ. Why? Because he fills my deepest need. And I want her to feel and think the same way in case I falter. I hope and pray that, that that doesn't happen. And I'm working hard to not allow that to happen in my life. And I want her to continue. Perhaps she might help me to remember from whence I have fallen. You see, that's what life is about. Life is about the Christ. It's about him filling the need, the void in our lives. And do you know when he fills that void, we will have confidence. We know that if things may not be going well, I got stability in God. And things are going well. I need to watch out that I don't put anything above him. You see, that's how it works. That's how the counsel of God works in our lives. Let's go to the next one. So authority of God, let me point, make this point here. The authority of God, with it, when it comes to him, it is inherent. He is all about it. Because he is the one who created. He is the counselor. He is the great physician. Let's look at another aspect of this. Remember the right to issue laws. Now, why would we say that in reference to understanding this perspective of authority when it comes to God? Why does he have the right to issue laws? He has the right to issue laws because of what we see there in Exodus chapter 20. 
Uh, this is where I was, get, trying to, I was getting ahead of myself. But when I go back to it, here is what we see in connection to why God has the right to issue laws. It's because he was the one who delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. He is the deliverer. That's why. Look there, those passages in Exodus chapter 20 there. And notice what is stated. God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. That's why he has the right to issue laws. You see, the laws that God gave Israel is similar to what we finally discovered in all of the digs and excavation. At one time, they believed uh, that there was not a Hittite empire. But they finally discovered that there was a Hittite empire. Not only did there was a Hittite empire, but there, they also found artifacts in reference to the treaties that this empire wrote. Do you know that the laws of God are similar to that treaty that he gave Israel? Here's the concept. If a conquering nation went in and conquered another nation, which the Hittites did, what they would do is give laws to that conquered nation. If you do what we tell you to do, you will enjoy your freedom. If you disobey, we are going to send our armies and we're going to crush you. Is that not what God did with Israel? When he delivered them from Egyptian bondage, he told them, here is what you will do. You will live like this. You will fulfill those things that I tell you to do. And then what you see in the book of Deuteronomy if you don't do them, there is what they call the blessings and the cursings. With the Hittite vassal treaty, what they did was they, the empire itself took a copy. And then what they did was gave another copy to the conquered nation. So the conquered nation couldn't say, well, we didn't know. <laughs> you got a copy of the treaty. And what they would do when that nation that conquered nation would disobey they'd pull out notice that's what it said on the treaty we warned you and they sent the army down and crushed them that's what God did with Israel he gave them the law if you follow what I tell you you're going to enjoy the blessings but if you disobey me I'm going to curse you in fact the ground is going to become hard it's not going to give produce I'm going to withhold the rain from you and that would be a warning that they were being disobedient to God and if they didn't listen then God would send diseases and if they didn't listen to that he would have another nation come in and conquer them and that's why you see in uh, the book uh, with the uh, Assyrian Empire coming in and taking captive the northern kingdom Prior to that, remember the book of Judges? What would happen? You know, everyone was doing right in their own eyes. And what God would do, he would allow another nation come in and they would oppress them. And then they would cry out to the Lord and the Lord would have mercy and the Lord would send a deliverer, which we call the Judges. That cycle was there. You could see that over and over again. So God has the right to issue laws because he is the deliverer. Just think about that on the level with Christ Jesus delivering us from sin. And we have a new covenant. If we're faithful, what happens? He blesses us. We get a taste of that blessing. Number one, we may not get monetary blessings, but we get spiritual strength to endure whatever hardship. And then if we die in the process, 
we have the hope of heaven, being with God with uninhibited fellowship. That's how it works. That's the blessings of this covenant in Christ Jesus. If we don't, as we go through the sufferings in this life, and if we die in our sins, what happens? We are eternally, or in eternity, separated from God. Here's another passage along with this to help us to see why God has the right to issue laws. Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 36. Remember the preaching that was done by the apostles there in those passages. As Peter preached about Jesus being the one whom God had delivered up. And then you also see Peter talking about Christ dying and then being raised from the dead. And he compares the resurrection of Christ to the grave of David. David's grave was still there, but the grave of the Christ was no longer there. Why? Because he had been raised from it. And now he is seated at the right hand of God. And as they pointed that out, remember, he's on his throne. He is reigning. That means that he is king. And a king has the right to issue laws. Let me paint this picture for you through the scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, do you remember where, when the disciples are with Jesus? And as they are with Jesus, he start, he's ascending into heaven. They're standing there. So that's where we, we see that perspective. Jesus ascending. And you have that image in your mind as Luke points these things out. But then you, when you turn over to Psalms chapter 24, verses 7 through 10, one of, uh, one of those pretty psalms I really love. And it causes me to think of this uh, military battle that has taken place. And in that military battle, the leader is the one who has come back victorious. And so in chapter 24, look at verses 7 through 10. And notice what the psalmist expresses here, the psalm of David, the king of glory. He says, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. What was the battle? The battle was living on earth and therefore showing how we ought to live and committing no sin, then being put to death where the serpent bruises his heel and when he is raised from the dead, crushing the head of the serpent in this battle that had taken place. And now he is alive forevermore and he is ascending into heaven. And the cry is, open up the gates. The king is coming. And then you turn over to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And when you see Daniel, uh, God revealing these things through uh, Daniel about the four kingdoms. But here is this picture that is given there of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. As Daniel has this vision, he says, I kept looking in the night vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. Remember, Jesus has ascended in the clouds, right? Into the heavens. And Daniel's given us the picture of him coming on the cloud. And remember, we read Psalms 24. The cry is, open up the gates. The king of glory, the Lord mighty in battle. And it says, and, was, uh, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented, uh, presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve 
him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's the king. That's a powerful king, isn't it? That king is so powerful, as we see from these passages, that he has the right to issue laws. He is a king. He rules. That's what Acts chapter 2 is pointing out to us. The Christ. That's why he has the right to issue laws. And you see this throughout the scriptures, pointing those things out. Here's another passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. What is he? He is the head of the church. He is the leader. And because he is the head, he has the right to issue laws. We are his church, those who, of us who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. We belong to him. And since we belong to him, he has every right to tell us what to do. He sets the standard. And so, my friend and brethren, when we take matters into our own hands and have not listened to the laws of Christ, we are violating the king's order. We're violating them. And sometimes we don't see this because what we have allowed is our desires over the king's desire. That's idolatry. We have defied the king. When God told Israel to put no other gods before him, they defiled him when they did so. Same concepts throughout the scriptures here. We are purchased by Christ. Purchased with his blood. So we belong to God. And so he has every right to tell us what to do. He has every right to issue laws and we are to abide by them. Let's go before I the power to do. One of the things about this concept is here is he has the right to do whatever he wants. First of all, Remember, we have already talked about him being the creator, the deliverer. In Genesis chapter 6 and 7, he brought judgment in the days of Noah, the flood. So what we're seeing here, he has the power to judge. He has the power to bring judgment. And when we're reading Genesis chapter 6, and seven, we are seeing the judgment of God on the whole world because it was a worldwide flood. I'm sure there were those who were trying to run to the mountains and think that if they're on the top of the mountains, that they would be safe. And they were not. That's power to do. To judge the whole world in that fashion. And yet, God delivered Noah and his family. Why? Because they were obedient. Noah constructed the ark as God had commanded. And then when God says, enter the ark, they entered. If Noah had said, you know, Lord, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about all these other people? God says, no, you go into the ark. Noah heeded God's instruction. And what was interesting about that, God was the one that closed the door. Because I, I, I suppose Noah or myself, was, wait a minute, let me open the door in case I hear people start screaming, hollering, let me in, let me in. I try to open the door to let them in to grab them. No, God closed the door. He had the right to do that. They didn't listen. And because they didn't listen, they were then destroyed. Another passage along that line is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 14. Remember, he 
his desire. He does what he sees fit. And that's what Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 14. I want you to notice how Isaiah points this out. Here's one of the things uh, I want to encourage you. When you're reading through the book of Isaiah, remember the name Isaiah is Jehovah is salvation. And when you're reading through the book of Isaiah, look for that point as you're going through the chapters. And you will see it that God is truly salvation as you're studying the book. But in chapter 40, I want you to notice verses 12 through 14. He says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in, a ba uh, in the balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? There's no one then. No one. That's the answer to the question. There is no counsel higher than God's counsel. And that's what's being pointed out here in Isaiah chapter 40. That he is able to do as he desires. That's God. That's why he has, the, because he has the power to do. Name anyone else that has that power. Uh, my hands are in my pocket. <laughs> I dare not raise them. But God does. In verse 14, with whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? It's inherently with him. Just like authority is inherently God. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. It is there that the Hebrew writer talks about God's promise to Abraham and in that promise that God guaranteed the fulfillment of that promise and the Hebrew writer says he swore or gave an oath and since we you and I we swear by someone greater but there's no one greater than God so he swore by himself his name was at stake and what happened God delivered And the Hebrew writer is saying, it's impossible for him to lie. There are no games when it comes to God. He is trustworthy. When he says what he says, he means what he says. That's the God we serve. If you were to ask Moses, he would tell you, yes, he means what he says. Speak to the rock, Moses. Moses struck it couldn't enter into the promised land and he begged God and God had to tell Moses that's enough you're not going but you can see it but you're not going in and Moses didn't go into the promised land God meant what he said and therefore you and I need to pay closer attention to these things I'll tell you what there's so much here I'll tell you what let me I'm gonna have to go through all of this a little quickly here. Uh, I'm just getting started. Uh, that's point one. Oh. <laughs> Didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> but notice the, the, the other thing here in reference to that, the right to rule. And so I'll, I'll go through this. Remember what Jesus pointed out there in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 and 16? Remember, he said he would build his church on the fact that he is the son of the living God. And that death or Hades would not prevent that from happening. And it was done. It was so. Death didn't prevent him from accomplishing what he said to Peter and the rest of the disciples there in Matthew 16. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, he's a ruler, heaven, earth. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, he did die as pointed out. However, he says, I'm alive forevermore. I have de uh, keys of both death and Hades. You see, God possesses that kind of power over death and even the realm of the dead. He has done this. 
And it was an encouragement for them as John writes this revelation. Look up earlier in chapter 1 of Revelation, verses 5 and 6 there. Notice what he had done when he did that. This is worth noting to encourage us to make sure that we're following the authority of God. And he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who lo uh, loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So again, what we're seeing there, that he is the one who is or who has the keys of death and Hades. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He has an exalted name. That's the key of Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. God exalted him, gave him a name which was above every name. And the thing is, everyone will bow. Let me say that again. Everyone will bow. That's how exalted that name is. That's how exalted his identity is. That's how high and exalted his authority is. When God exalts, we must and we will bow. And the next thing, let's look at the other perspective here when it comes to authority. We'll talk about man. The authority of men. When it comes to the authority of men, I want us to understand this. That's where you get that phrase, permission to act. Why is that? When you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 7, we are the created. We didn't create. We were created. So naturally... We are to submit ourselves to the Creator. And then when you're looking at these passages as well, in chapter 3, verse 6, verses 13 through 19, we sinned and disobeyed God. And because we disobeyed God, and because of sin, that made us less than what God intended us to be. That's why when it comes to the authority of men, the perspective is permission to act. It's because of sin. Here is something that, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, remember? Here's another thing. Because we came short of God's glory. That's what sin did. When God created us, we were here. But because of sin, we came down to here. We're in the muck and mire. Sin dirtied us up. That's why we have to have permission. Because we violated God's law. We violated God's instruction. What is interesting is when you look at Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, man made a mess. Because through one man, sin and death entered into the world. And death reigned upon all men. We made the mess. Yes, we were the ones that did that. And if we're making messes, why should we be in this position of authority? When we go away from God's authority, we're going to make a mess. That's the lesson. And so we need to turn back to God and follow his authority. In other words, we need to seek his permission on what we are to do. 
And if he doesn't give it, we don't do it. We do what he says. And that's what we're seeing in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 10, we are the clay. He made us from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became a living being. And so in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 10, Jeremiah is letting us know, or God through Jeremiah is letting us know how fragile we are. We're very fragile. I don't care how much we know, doesn't care, doesn't matter how much we have, we're fragile. Because death is reigning among all. When we sin, we fall short of God's glory, we are separated from Him, we are like clay in His hands. He has the power to destroy us. But yet he loves us and wants to mold us and put us back to where we were. And that can only be done through Christ Jesus. And then finally, here when it comes to man, Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 29. And so I'm going to be ending with these thoughts that Paul is expressing to those there in Athens as he is telling them about this statue that they had an inscription to the unknown God as they're trying to cover their bases. And Paul is pointing out to them this God. And so in Acts chapter 17, and looking at verse 24, he says, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed time and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children or the offspring of God. What is being said in those passages? One thing, one thing here is God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. The second thing is, we need him. That's what Paul is pointing out. We need him. And if we don't recognize that we need him, then what is going to happen is we're going to lose our souls. So when it comes to these two sources of authority, here are some conclusions here. Number one, the authority of men, it's inferior. It's inferior. The authority of God or the authority of heaven is far superior. Far superior. That's the God that we serve. That's the source that we should be looking to when it comes to life. My brethren, I hope, my friend, I hope I point these things out and that you understand and make the choice to submit to the authority of heaven. If you will, bow with me in a word of prayer. Merciful God and Father, thank you for all that you have blessed us with. 
in helping us to understand who you are and that your source is the best source because of who you are, what you have done, what you will do, the power that you possess, the authority in the position that you are, that we, as your creature, may humbly bow to you. Thank you for the mercy that you provided in Christ Jesus our Lord. And help us, Lord, to recognize our need and dependence on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, now's the time to do so before it's everlasting too late. And here's the reason why I say that. You're in the arena of death, condemnation, destruction outside of Christ. That's where you are. You're on that path. But because of what God has provided in Christ Jesus, here are the things that you can obtain in Christ. You can become or partake of the spiritual blessings that are in him. You can obtain forgiveness of your sin. You can uh, obtain or be in a heritage to God. Your name will be enrolled in heaven because of God. Because these things are found in Christ Jesus. You will be a new creation in Christ. And you will find salvation or deliverance in him. And what you need to do is put your faith in him. This is God's salvation system. This is God's order. And as you are in Christ Jesus, you're no longer in the arena of death and destruction. And what you need to do is to be baptized into Christ. And when you're baptized into Christ, that's when you are able to obtain those blessings. And as you continue to walk, as you continue to be obedient to the will of God, you have the hope of heaven. You will be given what God has promised. Remember what he did with Abraham. He can swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. And God delivered. That was a guarantee to Abraham. And God did deliver, didn't he? He'll deliver today in Christ Jesus. So put him on before it's too late. If you've fallen away from the Lord, you've gone back into that arena of death and destruction and condemnation as a brother, as a friend. Get out of that arena into the joys of heaven that God has provided in Christ Jesus. We're here. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. And so, my friend, if you are subject to the invitation that God has given, we encourage you to come and make it known.